First, I'll take out all the batteries. There are two rubber feet concealing screws that we'll need to remove. Then six screws holding the back on. I probably should have removed the microphone capsules, but we'll do that now, along with the SD card. The back lifts off easily, but is attached to the top by cables for inputs 1 and 2. A lot of the space in this unit is taken up by the XLR inputs. There are some large capacitors next to the connectors, which I assume is for low-pass filtering of the phantom power. The SD card flap can be removed now as well. So this PCB is the digital, or logic board, and we can take a closer look. This chip is the main processor. It's an NXP single-core ARM Cortex M7 chip running at 600 MHz. Not super impressive, but apparently enough to run the software on this device. Digging into the specs a little deeper, I don't see this as an ideal chip on its own to be able to process six channels of 32-bit audio. So it makes sense that when we look over here, we see this chip, which is an FPGA made by Lattice. I'm going to bet that a lot of the digital signal heavy lifting is handled by this guy. Which brings me to the main reason I wanted to open this up. It's not entirely clear to me how Tascam implemented 32-bit audio recording, and I feel they could have done a much better job in the marketing department here. This is from their website, and this is in my mind a pretty amazing feature that we're going to see on more and more prosumer grade audio recorders. What they're doing here is applying two levels of gain to an input, sending each to an analog to digital converter, and then combining the digital signals. So when the audio is low, the high gain circuit can pull out more dynamic range from the signal, and when the audio is loud, digital information from the low gain circuit replaces the top end where the high gain stream would otherwise clip. Now this picture is right next to the previous one, but it is an entirely different feature that is not at all related to having dual preamps and it has to do with the fact that the audio is recorded as a floating point number. I won't go into the 32-bit floating point audio format as it really needs its own video to explain. I'll put a link in the description to that video. So back to the dual preamps. This is the block diagram Tascam provides as a PDF download. Notice there is absolutely no mention of dual preamps or ADCs. I'm guessing it's just a simplification, but to be sure, I need to see those preamps and ADCs for myself. So let's keep disassembling this unit. The internal speaker is at the bottom. There are two screws holding it in. Once these are out, you can also remove a plastic trim piece. The rotary encoder is attached by a soldered cable, so we need to remove this too. Flipping it around, I first carefully pull off the knob. Now here's something weird. There's a tiny piece of ribbon, and I don't know at this point where it came from. I thought it was just a piece of packaging that maybe got under the wheel, but we'll see later. This is actually far more interesting. The logic board is held in by four screws. Two at the top also attach grounding wires. I don't like that these grounding wires rely on the screw to make electrical contact. As you can see, there's some padding under the terminals, which seems odd to me. Okay, at this point I paused and took a long time before deciding to pry up this PCB. I was fairly confident that there would be a board-to-board -board connector holding it back, but I was also afraid maybe I missed a screw or something was glued. To make it easier, I removed the top microphone connectors, but first marked one of the cables so I wouldn't mix them up. Eventually, I used a flathead screwdriver to carefully pry up at the bottom of the board. I didn't film this part because I wasn't sure if it was the right thing to do. Okay, so now we can see the bottom of the logic board as well as a heat sink slash shielding plate over the audio board below. Nothing surprising here. On the left, we have a couple SD RAM chips. The one in the middle is flash memory. And there's a battery, support circuitry, etc. There are four screws that hold in this stamped piece of galvanized steel. This time I brought out the microscope to have a look. And... Oh! I recognize this chip. It's an OPA 1678 dual-channel op-amp made by Texas Instruments. 
this is a preamp. And it's a pretty good one. This, on the other hand, I did not recognize. But after some Googling, I found this. These are the analog to digital converters. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with this chip maker, and I was expecting to see a TI branded chip or similar for the ADCs. Please leave a comment below if you're familiar with these, and if the AK5704 is a good ADC, or something Tascam had to compromise on because of the chip shortage. Now this is a four channel chip, so if this device can record six channels, and it's using dual preamps and ADCs, then we expect to see three 5704 chips and six OPA1678 chips for a total of 12 channels. I only see two and five. Oh well, let's put it back together. Okay, I have to know where the missing chips are. After reassembling it, it bothered me too much, so I took it apart again. And I found a bad design when removing this cable. It's routed underneath the XLR inputs 3 and 4, unlike the other one which goes between the XLR inputs. You can see it's crushed here by the XLR module. Now, to be fair, I assembled it without the cable, and there is some clearance by design, but it's not much. So, this is questionable engineering, but let's move on. Finally, here's the underside of the audio board. The two chips you see here are electronic audio amplifiers. These do the mixing. Here is our missing 5704 ADC chip. And here is, wait a minute, this is not an OPA1678. Oh, of course, it's a digital to analog converter, a DAC. This is the Texas Instruments PCM1754, and it's used to play back audio from the digital files. Now, what about this over here? This was a bit of a mystery until I reverse image searched and found references to the TPA4411 headphone amp chip. This is interesting because it doesn't look like a Texas Instruments chip, but other reviews have noted how good the headphone amp is on these units. But where are the missing preamps? Well, we have a clue in the specs. See, the characteristics for input jacks 1 and 2 are different from jacks 3 through 6. This tells me that they are not using the OPA 1678 op amps. And going back to a data sheet that I kind of glossed over, well, there you have it. The 5704 has a built-in microphone preamp, and it can also supply plug-in power. So why not use it, right? Again, I'm not familiar with these chips, so I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Okay, now let's put it back together. Oh right, remember that little ribbon piece? Well, the first time I reassembled it, the scroll wheel wouldn't stay on. It seems they got the tolerances wrong, and the plastic was not a press fit onto the encoder shaft, so Tascam literally shoved a piece of scrap in there to make it fit. All right, so we know the Porta Capture X8 has the hardware to do what Tascam alluded to. How is it doing it? Well, I recorded four samples. I first removed the microphones and recorded the noise floor at 0 dB gain and 36 dB gain. Then I put the mics back on, shoved it into a fan, and recorded the loudest white noise I had at hand, again at 0 dB and 36 dB. Then I opened the wave files with a hexadecimal editor, a riff file editor, and loaded the samples into MATLAB to explore the values recorded. Finally, I just contacted Tascam, and an engineer got back to me to confirm that, yes, there are dual ADCs, and yes, their gain is fixed. Changing the gain in the settings does not affect the analog stages of this device at all. What the gain setting does do is affect where in the 32-bit float data space the values from the ADCs are stored. This is fancy for saying it tells the WAV file how loud playback should be. But due to the resolution of 32-bit float, no information is ever lost. All right, I didn't want to make a full-blown review video, but I did have a few words to say. Uh, first of all, you can see I'm recording at a very high gain right here, and uh, you'll hear in the audio after I normalize it that uh, you won't hear any clipping. And same thing, I should be able to go in here uh reduce the gain all the way down so that we're at minus 
40-ish dB. And uh, again, when this part is normalized, you shouldn't hear any of the noise floor. So I got a really good deal on this, and that's the only reason I spent the money on this device. I would not have spent $500 or even $400 on this just because I, I don't have that in my budget right now for a little uh, portable field recorder. But I've decided to keep it because I do really like the 32-bit recording mode. It's, it's so nice to not have to worry about levels and know I'm not going to miss anything while I'm recording my audio. And so far I've done a little bit of field recording. I captured some noises from some home construction that was happening and that was a really good test because uh, I had some really high peaks from some like hammering and, and prying um, outside the house and it didn't distort any of that. I was able to capture that audio and it made some really cool sounds. Um, all right, so things that really bug me though, Tascam had a real opportunity here going to a color touch screen display and I feel like they'd really drop the ball on the UI here. I have the old DR05 and the interface and the, and, the, and the workflow is pretty much the same on this device as it is here. Uh, one example, when you go to, I can't show it right now because I'm actually using it to record this audio. When I'm out and I record a noise um, in the field, around the house or whatever, I want to hit stop on the recording, click on the file name and just immediately rename it. And I can't do that. I have to go back into the player mode, click the file, click play, go to edit, uh, like set the file name. And then there's another really weird limitation here that doesn't make any sense at all to me. So on this device, kind of made sense because it's an older, the file names are limited to, I think, uh, six to nine characters, right? So like you can type in a file name, it has to be six, can't be shorter, can't be longer than nine. So that really limits what you can type in for a file name, right? It's the same thing on this. Why? <laughs> Why, Tascam? What on earth? It, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. I want to be able to just say, like, door creaking, but I have to have some weird abbreviation to be able to, to rename that file. And it, oh, man, it doesn't make any sense to me. And it's such an annoying feature that would have been so easy, I feel like, for them to implement. So... And that's not all. So there's other things about this UI that really frustrate me. I really wish that playback was easier. Um, I mean, this is a portable device and I feel like it should have been a lot easier to be able to scroll through uh, the recordings, find certain places in them. It's not at all. It's very hard and clunky. And I just don't understand why they put the menu system the way they did. They have this nice touch screen and yet, um, to play a file, you have to press the button. Uh, and that kind of tripped me up for a while. Is like, why can't I get these files to play? You have to hit the play button here. There's nothing on the touch screen. So I don't think I'm misunderstanding this. I've spent quite a bit of time with this device. I know there were some other reviewers on YouTube here that uh, had some complaints. And I think their complaints were misplaced because they didn't quite understand the UI. I understand it, and uh, this does, it does a lot, but there's also just like the opportunities are missed, and I just don't understand why Tascam didn't put a UX team on this project. So what is it good for? Like, so I am going to use this for strictly recording audio in 32-bit. I'm probably not going to use any of the other modes because why would I, right? I've got the space on the SD cards. I haven't used the XLR inputs yet, but actually that's one other piece of this that I don't like is that um, I would have really preferred a recorder that was smaller, right? So like I could have done without the XLR inputs and if I just had this and maybe a line in and this was way shrunk down, I would have been so happy because for a field recorder, that would be all I need. But they added the XLR inputs and they added some other weird things in the UI like a podcasting app. I just don't understand the choices they made with the, the apps. I always just use the, the manual mode and set my inputs and record that way. It's like they kind of added that on as, as 
to kind of capture some other markets. But from a professional audio point of view, again, it's not really clear what they're doing with the 32-bit because they're letting you set gain. But if you're going to just post-process it anyway, like everybody will do, then, you know, why even have the gain um, in that mode? And if they're not going to do that and they're going to make this for like your average consumer who wants to just start up a podcast, then it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be for something like that. And I don't think they really hit that market on the head either. It's it's a confusing device and I think it has an identity issue. But that being said, I like the hardware and I like its capabilities and so if this thing was more polished, I would I would just absolutely love it. It would be just my favorite thing ever. But for now, it's just a useful tool that I appreciate its usefulness. This wasn't supposed to be a full-blown review, but these are, I think, important points to make. So, yeah, I really hope you found this video useful. Um, please hit that subscribe button and the like button. Uh, please leave a comment down below if I missed anything or you have other uh, comments or questions or whatever. I really appreciate your comments. Well, that's it. Thanks for watching, guys, and uh, we'll see you next time.